I'm going to read you scenes uh, that all took place at the Mount. And the first scene, it's October of um, 1907. And it has snowed, a very early snow. And um, Morton Fullerton um, is coming to visit, has come to visit Edith for the first time at the Mount. They've been friends in Paris, and he's been flirting with her. Um, and now he's come to the Mount, and she's got uh, somebody at the Mount staying with her because she had guests all the time. And um, Elliot Gregory was um, something of a columnist and a wag of the era. Mm -hmm. Um, I imagine he was uh, a mischief maker of sorts, and he has already warned her, uh, I'd be careful of Fullerton, because he has quite a reputation, so she's already been warned that he's um, quite a charming man. Um, what's happened now, as I, as I start the scene, is that um, Elliot has gone up to bed, um, she and Morton are alone, and um, she, he has been told that if you, in the some, certain times of year, you can smell the pines at night here, and he uh, takes her out onto the terrace um, to smell the pines. Now there's there's snow on the terrace. Um, they put on their galoshes and their 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 coats or their wraps, and they come out here together. The scent of the pines reaches their noses the moment the French doors are opened. The shock of cold is vitalizing. With the heavy clouds mostly gone, the stars gleam like ice chips in the sky. Ghostly outlines trace the hedges in the gardens and the lindens in the lime walk below. Edith relishes the sound of her feet crunching on the inch and a half of snowfall. What a perfect night, he tells her. Makes me think of my childhood. The air here is an elixir. I can see why you chose this place. Yes, it's very special. He gestures to the garden. In this light, it looks black and white, like a steel engraving. How accurate and clever, she thinks, noting that the scene does indeed seem devoid of color. It's nighttime, by the way, on the face of it. His voice grows intimate. I almost didn't come here, you know. Why? The train schedule was impossible. I had to change trains three times. It would have been easier to go directly to my parents. What changed your mind? You. He turns to her. I wanted more of your company. She feels an exquisite expansion of her lungs. It's not unlike the one and only time she was allowed to take a roller coaster ride as a child. Her mother had a headache, so her father took her for the afternoon to the Frascati Gardens in Paris. She can still recall the big sign with its gold and red letters, Le Chemin de Centrefuge. We'll keep this a secret from your mother, her father had said. Oh, how special Edith felt that day. They'd had to wait in line in the sun for ages. She remembers her trembling, childish anticipation as they were ushered into their little carriage and strapped in with leather straps. Her father put his arm around her, and the tiny train began a slow, frightening ascent up the steel mountain. Are you afraid, her father whispered in her ear. No, Papa, because I'm with you. And then, at the top of the hill, <coughs> They were looking out over all eternity. When the coaster descended, she had the sensation that her stomach dropped away, allowing her lungs to expand to ten times their size. And this is exactly how she feels right now. The rush of air into her lungs leaves her speechless for a moment. I'm so pleased you decided to come, she finally manages to tell Fullerton, though her voice meters out, breathy and soft. After being here, Edith, I shall never think of you the same. She shivers at the sound of her Christian name from his lips. No? Houses say so much about people, don't they? I've always thought so. Yes, I know you do. The way you describe houses speaks volumes about your characters. You even use house in your title, the House of Mirth. It's from Ecclesiastes, isn't it? So few people realize that. My father is a minister. The way you describe, oh sorry, my father is a minister. I grew up with a Bible always at hand. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Did I get it right? Well done, she says. He steps back on the terrace so he can see the house more fully. If I were a reader and you were a character, I'd say this house belongs to an extraordinarily haunting woman at the peak of her life. Would you like me to tell you more? <laughs> yes, she says hesitantly. <laughs> she has seen the world and delights in its bounty, but doesn't need to prove it to anyone. 
She brings together the classicism of New England with the sophistication of Europe. But there are secrets here, illusion, doors that look double on one side, but are in fact single on the other. I believe your life is rather like those doors. My life, she asks. She knows that she has grown crimson. Whatever do you mean? Edith, he says, then nothing more. She revels in the tingling feeling his words have generated. Does he know that she and Teddy are nothing to one another? That she is a free and single soul? The air is icy, the breeze picking up, but the warmth between them is palpable. And what does your home in Paris say about you, she asks. It says I rent a few rooms from a landlady because I'm a poor, lowly journalist. He gently takes her elbow and turns her back so her eyes meet his. It says, I would rather be at Edith Wharton's house. She hears her breath catch. Mr. Fullerton, she says too loudly, it's late. For a moment, he doesn't let go of her arm. They stand face to face in the snow, alone, the fog of their breath blending and swirling together in the cold. He finally releases her and leaving her on the terrace, removes Teddy's galoshes at the French door, doors. Albert, hearing them return, takes the dripping overshoes with a look of distaste. Mm -hmm. Edith, after stamping her feet at the door, sits on the sofa to remove her boots. She feels self-conscious because she knows Fullerton is watching her. Yes, is there anything I can get you, she asks. She shudders at how dismissive he, she sounds. Her tone reminds her of how her mother used to speak to her father. No, thank you. I have everything. I'll be going up to bed. There is a touch of hurt in his voice. Good night, Mr. Fullerton. Sleep well. Call me Will. My family does. She smiles weakly. She can't quite imagine him calling him Will. It is too simple, too American. Might I call you Morton? Henry sometimes does. Henry James. Call me any name but Mr. Fullerton, he says. Good night, Morton, she says, and listens to each and every one of his footsteps up the stairs. And then there's a space. And let me just say that... Um, Jules was an old dog who died that year, and Nisette and Me Too were little tiny dogs that were her, her little companions that you see in pictures of her sometimes. The next day, after an excited night tossing, often waking, Edith props herself up in bed and writes, but stops early, feeling the tug of wanting to see Fullerton again. Elliot and Fullerton are chatting by the drawing room fire when she comes downstairs. Would anyone like a tour of the gardens? She asks. Elliot shakes his head, announcing he's happy to stay inside, with old Jules warming his feet. Jules barely lifts his head to acknowledge Edith's presence and sighs loudly as he settles his chin back down on Elliot's velvet slipper. But Fullerton stands, and with an impish smile, raises his hand like a little boy at school. Wraps and boots are supplied, and the pups intuitively head for the French doors. As Edith and Fullerton work their way down the icy staircase from the terrace, he holds out his arm for her. She grabs onto the warm tweed of his coat, relishing the solidity of his muscles. Fullerton turns his head to her, his eyes gleaming. So this is how Admiral Peary felt as he ventured out into the frozen wild. Imagine the set and me too pulling our dog sled. The thin panes of ice at the edges of the steps shatter beneath their feet. The dogs run ahead onto the pristine garden paths, kicking up flurries of white, letting out shrill, fox-like yelps. Frosted like ice cream bombs, the lime trees, whose beauty arises from how they flutter, now stand encased in ice, paralyzed, like the trees and murals she's seen in old New England houses, epic, childlike. Beneath them, Fullerton gathers sticks brought down by the storm and tosses them towards the dogs for a game of fetch. As Edith watches his youthful antics, she feels as though Fullerton is the only object in her world that's moving at normal speed. All else feels slowed. The late morning sun breaks at an angle through the pines, spreading the hedges and frozen beds with buttery light. She can hear her own heartbeat in her ears. How measured it sounds. The snow silences all else. Has she ever felt so extraordinarily sated or content? The game moves farther and farther along the path toward the edge of the woodlands until Fullerton has gone so far he stands and waves and begins to run back to her. He exudes such joy as though he could not possibly wish to be anywhere else or with anyone else. 
Later, as they walk through the beds of frozen flowers, their footsteps match, and Edith can feel the heat and pressure of his arm through her wraps. It makes her too breathless, too giddy, so she stoops to tap snow off the once glorious chrysanthemums. I do hate seeing the season end like this, she says. What was just yesterday, an efflorescence of russet and spice has grown limp and blistered, black and slimy. It's a shame you weren't here even one day sooner. The garden was still beautiful. I wouldn't have given up the snow for all the flowers you had, Fullerton says. We'll remember the snow. I might not have remembered the flowers. She's warm by how he speaks of them as we. As they chat and stroll beyond the gardens and through the shady paths, Edith finds it difficult to concentrate on his words. She is so distracted by the insistence of his presence. She feels dented by him. He marks her soul more than anyone she's ever known. She thinks briefly of Elliot's warning. Fullerton is indeed a very charming man. <laughs>